welcome back to a brand new episode. For today's video, we are talking about Alien Romulus. Now, it's kind of a hotly debated movie, I guess. There are people that really, really love it and people that really don't. I think that's how you know it's a good movie. I went to go see this and Long Legs at the drive-ins. So I got a bit of a different viewing experience. I would like to watch this one again, just because it's so densely packed with horror and action, but also kind of the theology that went into Alien itself, the original. It's all sprinkled in there, so it's a very dense movie filled with just like a bunch of different Easter eggs, really. I don't think that's a bad thing. Some people are knocking it for that, that it was like fanfare, you know, but I don't mind that to be honest with you, as long as it's done well. So, this newest iteration, I guess, this newest chapter is directed by Fed Alvarez, and this was originally meant for Hulu, but Disney decided to give it the full layout, which that's crazy. Is the Xenomorph Queen now a Disney princess? Is Ripley a Disney princess? <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> this movie actually did really well worldwide. Uh, 110 million. That's good for a horror movie. So the just basic plot for um, Romulus is space colonizers come face to face with the most terrifying life form in the universe while scavenging the deep ends of a derelict space station. Okay. <laughs> and that space station is part of the Romulus Remus as well because it's multiple like sections of this station. And I believe what happened was because it they're on the ship from the original, right? Or the ship that they bring stuff back to. is They're not on the Nostromo, but they do show, I believe, a space probe from this space station probing Nostromo, and then they brought it back. I think, I think. <laughs> it gets a little murky, you guys. The starring cast in this, Kaylee Spaney is Rain, Eileen Wu is Navarro, Archie Renau, Renau, I believe, plays Tyler, David Johnson plays Andy, and Spike Fern plays Bjorn. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly too. And once again for this one, I am going to be referencing two of the like writings. We're not going to get into it super deep, but I will probably just read like a little quote from either or just to, I don't know, reiterate the idea. Um, but so with Carol J. Clover, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, um, it's just your basic concept of the final girl. It's pretty much following it down to a T, especially with Ripley, because they really pushed for Rain to have her own kind of like Ripley moment in the movie. Oh, so we're diving in now somewhat. But I also do have like the actual plot printed off so that we can kind of go point for point because I do have some notes that I took. But yeah, I don't think there's many like actual direct quotes from this one I have. It's just the character of Rain is very much an embodiment of like Sigourney Weaver's character. And that is very much the embodiment of this theory of the final girl. Um, she's not sexual. She's even somewhat like in between, you know, androgynous in a way, extremely strong, level-headed. I don't know if Rain necessarily embodies that for the entire film, but by the time we get to the end, you know, Sigourney's character, Ripley, the, she's introduced right off the bat as she's the final girl. And Rain is too, but just because we focus in on her, there's nothing necessarily, it's gonna sound mean maybe, but there's nothing necessarily special to her until she's thrown into the situation, you know? So that's that one. I don't have much to reference for that one other than just the whole concept of final girl and whatnot. But Barbara Creed and the Monsters Feminine does directly talk about Alien as well and more so specifically in the chapter on the archaic mother. It gets a little oedipus i I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but I do have a few quotes that I wanna give that'll kinda just like frame this idea of what the archaic mother is. So this is 
Horror and the Archaic Mother, The Monstrous Feminine. I'm on page 19 if we want to <laughs> cross-reference our notes. <laughs> Although the Archaic Mother, as a visible figure, does not appear in Alien, her presence forms a vast backdrop for the enactment of all the events. She is there in the images of birth, the representations of the primal scene, the primal scene is where it gets a little oedipus -y, where it, it gets weird, okay? I'm just going to give that fair warning. We're not going to talk about it here. It gets weird. Some of these do go back to Freudian ideas. Freud wasn't all just about, like, oh, kids want to sleep with their parents. That wasn't his entire argument. <laughs> There's only one paper he did, guys. <laughs> but it does get a little weird. The womb-like imagery. The long winding tunnels leading to inner chambers, the rows of hatching eggs, the body of the mothership, the voice of the life support system, and the birth of the alien. She is the generative mother, the pre phallic mother, the being who exists prior to knowledge of the phallus. So kind of like this mother earth kind of like idea of like a regenerative power that doesn't need male influence the male influence in this movie is the xenomorph it's the embodiment of the male energy i guess within the mothership and the ship is referred to as mother and then a quote from another book <laughs> fetishism in the horror film by roger Dadun, Dadown, a mother thing situated beyond good and evil, beyond all organized forms and all events. This is a totalizing and oceanic mother, a shadowy and deep unity, evoking in the subject the anxiety of fusion and of disillusion, a mother who comes before the discovery of the essential beyonds, that of the phallus. This mother is nothing but a fantasy inasmuch as she is only ever established as an omnipresent and all-powerful totality, an absolute being. By the very intuition, she has no phallus that deposes her. This idea of like the phallus coming up a lot, I understand if that makes it weird for some people, but part of the idea of the archaic mother is that she has already been castrated it gets murky like i said all right so please don't get mad at me <laughs> and there's this concept of the mother now we're going through all this before we dive into the actual film because it directly <laughs> it directly talks about this and i don't want to be having a flip back and forth so the very last quote that i have not true it is the notion of mother as abyss that is central to alien it is the abyss the cannibalizing black hole from which all life comes and to which all life returns that is represented in the film as a source of deepest terror that comes from space the mothership itself which seems to be protecting the crew from the harshness of space while at the same time trapping them in with the deadliest creature ever known. And that creature itself also represents an even more archaic mother, ar more archaic than the spacecraft itself, which claims to be mother as well. I know y'all, I know. <laughs> and it also gives us a very good, just kind of alien closer as well. I mean, in the book, The Monstrous Feminine, it's referring to Ripley, but we can look at it the same exact way for Rain because it's the same exact scene. Ripley enters her sleep pod, assuming a virgin-like repose, skimmed down into just the bare clothes. The nightmare is over and we are returned to the opening sequence of the film, where birth was a clean, pristine affair. The final sequence worked not only to dispose of the alien, but also to repress the nightmare image of the archaic mother. Constructed as a sign of abjection within the text's patriarchal discourses, Alien presents a fascinating study of the archaic mother and of the fear her image generates. I know, it's a lot. So, with all of that, and we'll touch more on it as we go, I want to dive into this. So, my notes 
for these movies was kind of all over the place because I was typing them in my car <laughs> while I was trying to watch the films, which honestly way better than a movie theater. So the opening shot of the movie is of a Wayland yutani that's like the megacorp, you know, space probe investigates the wreckage of the USCSS Nostromo collecting an organic object containing a xenomorph. This is is part of the space probe that then goes back to Romulus, I believe. Rain Carradin, an orphan, works with her adopted brother, Andy. Now, Andy's character loved him, loved him so much, but I thought he was way older, way, way older. It doesn't necessarily read that they're like the same age, you know? Andy looks way older in the movie. I thought he was like 50. And Andy is a reprogrammed synthetic human. Now, I did pick up kind of a vibe between, now there's way more emotional connection between like the human and synthetic relationship in this movie. We have always had kind of like a distaste for them within the franchise. This movie, you really get emotionally connected to Andy and Rain specifically knowing how much they mean to each other and how she just like really tries to look after him and keep him safe. I was tearing up a few times for Andy, all right? <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. But at the same time, you know, there's the relationship between synthetic and human. There's also the relationship between human and corporation. And it's, mm, if this is what the future looks like, y'all have fun. <laughs> After her contract is forcibly extended by Waylon Yutani, she agrees to join her ex-boyfriend Tyler to a derelict spacecraft to retrieve cryostasis chambers. These chambers will, will allow Rain and her friends, Tyler, his pregnant sister Kay, cousin Bjorn, and Bjorn's girlfriend Navarro, to escape to the planet Ivaga. Andy's ability to interface with the onboard computer system is crucial for the mission, and so Rain is hesitant, of course, to send Andy up, but is convinced by Tyler and Andy to allow him to assist. For a world that is so heavily regulated, why is it that they're just able to take a random spacecraft up, straight up to this just randomly, no one has seen this before spacecraft? I don't think so. I saw a theory on TikTok, I roll, I know. But there's a lot of good film theory on there. Saw a theory on TikTok that Tyler, who is military, is actually working for Wayland yutani and knew that there was something on that ship that he needed to bring back. There's always, there is always an aspect of the big man, like the corporation, meddling their fingers in everything. Not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but this whole franchise is kind of built on the conspiracy theory that Wayland Dutani is this horrible, evil corporation that wants to, like, basically bring the end to humanity, dude. But also, like, the lore for this franchise goes so deep, and we're going to have to do a franchise deep dive. Working through it chronologically, because I want to start with Prometheus, man. <laughs> that movie just sets the stage for how deep this lore goes and that like religion, the creation of man all stems from this greater source. It's, listen, this is why it took me so long to finally sit down and do this video because of how dense the Alien franchise is and we've never touched on it before yet on this channel. I feel like there's a lot of catching up that we have to do. They fly the hauler, Corbelin, to the spacecraft, which is revealed to be a station divided into parts, Romulus and Remus, a reference to the Roman legend of Romulus and Remus, uh, the two kings of Rome, I believe, that were suckled on the breast of wolves. <laughs> While retrieving stasis chambers, Tyler, Bjorn, and Andy accidentally revive frozen face huggers and trigger a lockdown. Now, this is where it gets juicy. This scene was so dope. The water and the face huggers moving through them. I, one, am kind of grateful that Disney has re-picked up the Alien franchise so that now we know there's production going into this. 
everything was practical. The sets were all practical, the effects all practical, and it shows. It looks so good. For once, y'all, we have an alien movie that looks as good as the originals. That hasn't happened in a long time. I'm sorry, I just, I don't like CGI. I don't care if the alien looks stupid. It's gonna look so much better just being real. And the whole birth pod scene, oh, incredible. There was some heavy CGI in this because of like, they had zero gravity moments. I did love the zero gravity blood scene. That was, <laughs> that was maybe the only CGI there was other than the space scenes. So, but we do see the return of Mother, M-U-T-H-E-R. That's the name of the ship that they are on. And that also, like, once I saw Mother pop up, I was like, oh, we're getting back into the original. Because <laughs> I feel like after a certain point, they just became slasher films. And it's always been a slasher film. If you look at how slasher films are set up, especially written by uh, Carol Clover, it's a slasher movie. It's a slasher movie. I'm sorry if you don't want to think that, that's fine. But it's a slasher movie. It follows them all down to a T. But it's going back to that original deep message that an alien was intended to have. Because Alien, the original, is also a metaphor for sexual violence. I mean, forced impregnation. The alien itself looks like a giant, like, <laughs> does have those connotations, but I love movies where it's not hitting you over the head. Like, you can enjoy Alien for just what it is, or you can deep dive into the psychology of it if you want to. That's what I think is so beautiful about horror. If it's done well, you don't have to think about it, but it's there if you want to, you know? So yeah, the whole lockdown happens when they're trying to grab the cryopods and the face huggers are swimming around doing their thing, looking nasty. I've always hated the concept of the face hugger. It, freaks me out it's too spider-like so to override the lockdown rain installs a chip from a dan damaged android rook which is also reprising the role of rook now the actor who played him passed away a few years ago i think it might have been like in 2014 maybe with the permission of his family they used regenerative ai or something like that to recreate his character for the few scenes that he was in. I enjoyed Rook coming back. He was kind of like the exposition that the film needed, other than when Rain kind of overrides Andy's already prime directive with that of the ships, which other than the birth scene later on at the very end, and if you know, you know, Andy's switching of directive scene was one of the most terrifying scenes in the entire movie. When she asks him to like reassure like, Andy, what's your prime directive? And it's supposed to be like protect rain, something like that. And he says, my prime directive is to do what's best for the company. Oh, <coughs> oh that shit was good. All right. <laughs> so as the crew group flees the chamber, a face hugger latches onto Navarro. Rain reactivates Rook, who discloses that the station's crew was killed by the Xenomorph and its clones. While Tyler tries to remove the creature, Rook warns it may have implanted a seed. Despite Andy's attempts to stop him, Bjorn flees with Navarro on the Corbelin, and a chestburster emerges from Navarro, killing her. It's a horrifying scene. I think it's probably one of the bloodiest goriest chest burster scenes we've had and they don't even show it directly you're watching the other character's reaction as it's happening that's such good horror in my opinion Faye alvarez get him to do the next one please he's good at this <laughs> and i'm sorry if i'm looking down a lot guys i gotta check my notes it's such a dense movie and such a dense franchise to just be Diving into on the latest installment, <clears throat> the Corbelin, with Kay and Bjorn aboard, crashes into the Romulus hangar. 
this all just seemed too freaking perfect that they flew off and then somehow got right back into the hangar completely by accident okay jeopardizing the station's orbit and leaving less than an hour before it collides with Jackson's planetary rings. Kay is knocked unconscious from the impact and the chestburster escapes into the ship. She regains consciousness and runs into Bjorn, who discovers and attacks the xenomorph gestating into its adult form before dying from its acid blood. This scene was so good. So good. Not to get too, like, visual with it, but the, you know, how do I say this safely for YouTube? The egg that resembles the female anatomy. Mix that with the phallic imagery of the alien itself. It's so freaky. <laughs> this is kind of like that abjection that Barbara Creed is talking about when talking about the archaic mother is this just unsettling nature it's so hard to explain it's so hard to explain especially for youtube guidelines but that scene was bone chilling and just the fact that it was all done practically i love it <laughs> also this isn't a popular thought online go figure but a lot of the projected hate that Andy gets from some of the other crew members, I know it's because he's a robot, I know. But the fact that this is the first person of color to portray a synthetic within the Alien franchise, as far as I'm aware, it feels racially motivated. Right? Like, right? That's such a small part, I don't want to dwell on that because I don't think it's necessarily crucial it's really only with Bjorn's character that you feel that like ugh, nastiness so once he dies <laughs> then Andy can go back to being the hero that he is even if he's controlled by Wayland Utani. but that actually saved them on multiple occasions because when the whole face hugger or no so once the alien gestates and is birthed you know k is trying to get out and they need andy to unlock one of the doors to let her in but he notices that the xenomorph is waiting it's not waiting to kill her it's waiting for them to open that door so he saved them he saved them even though it was you know unfortunately at the price of someone else's life that's how you expect these synthetics that work for Wayland yutani to think, because that's how we've seen them. <laughs> that's how we've seen them act to the entire franchise. They're always going to take the interest. It might seem like it's the best interest of the, the crew, but it's not. It's the best interest of the corporation. Kay is attacked and dragged away. Andy finds samples of a compound scientists had extracted from the xenomorphs which Rook calls the Prometheus Fire. And I believe this is the black goo that the original, what are they called, architects? Or, you know, the original engineer, whatever. They drank that to break down their own DNA to then go and create mankind. I know, I know. <laughs> if you're not used to the deep, story lore of alien it can be a lot there's an alien that turns into a mountain okay and yeah that black goo is intended to perfect humans rook insists the samples must be brought to the colony and prevents the corbelin from leaving without them rain and tyler rescue k from a cocoon but tyler is killed and andy is incapacitated and he's left there for a while this it felt very like wilson vibes i was so connected to this robot which they set up that like you're supposed to have feelings for him but then you see how everyone else around in this like society treats these synthetics and they just have no remorse <laughs> so badly injured k injects herself with the compound during their escape in case the pregnant one too i believe yeah you already know where that's going <laughs> <laughs> Rain returns to the Romulus, helps Andy by removing the control chip, 
thus returning his loyalty to Rain, and disables the ship's gravity in order to shoot the xenomorphs while keeping their blood away from the hull. That scene was very intense. Very intense. I mean, I just love to see Rain, and it's all the same technology from the original movie. So the same guns, the exact same like keypads and everything, they got it to a T, you guys. It's fanfare done right, okay? It's not like, I don't know, like what the new Chucky movie maybe, or I don't know. There's been so many remakes lately that they do such a sh like surface level kind of the new Texas Chainsaw that Netflix did, okay? When they decide to kill off Sally. That, like, you know, they put in these characters or these little hints to draw people in, but it doesn't lead to much. This one, I feel like it does well. And you get some great violence. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but you do. You get some good violence in this. So they make it to the Corbelin just before the station crashes into the rings, destroying Rook and, you know, everything that was going on there. And as Rain and Andy prepare for their trip to Ivaga, Kay, affected by the compound injection, gives birth to a rapidly growing human xenomorph hybrid. This thing was freaking creepy. I know we've gotten, like, human hybrid xenomorphs before. This one was freaking scary, okay? And it goes into... I can't remember the specific chapter, I'll be honest. But it goes more into this idea of, like, this horrifying mother. The... Not just the mothership itself, but now Kay, who is a mother to this abomination. And she reacts as such she rejects her own child whereas when we saw a xenomorph in the past that was part human it rejected the mother but this time it's the mother rejecting the child and further from that rain even ejects herself from mother the ship during a sequence when she's just out floating in space. It's there if you want to, you know, like, break it apart and analyze it and whatnot. This, like, toss back and forth from, like, these mother figures and the rejection of their children. Because even mother, the ship, rejects the life that's on it in favor of the xenomorphs. So... It's just, it's juicy. You can sink your teeth into it if you want. The hybrid ends up killing Kay, so the child then rejecting its mother, and injures Andy, but Rain manages to eject the creature into Jackson's rings. She places Andy in a chamber and records a log about their arrival at Ivaga before entering stasis herself. And that's when you get that final just image of birth being clean again no longer having this oppressive presence to it so yeah that's the basic rundown for this it's a lot to get into so i feel like our next franchise deep dive might have to be on the alien series because it's just it's so dense and it's so rich with not just lore the story of it all but also the psychology behind it i find is really freaking interesting but yeah i want to know your thoughts guys whether you enjoyed this movie or not uh if you didn't let me know why i'm so down to hearing people's takes on stuff you know so yeah let me know your thoughts down in the comments like and subscribe thank you so much you guys i truly do appreciate you and i will catch you in the next one take care